Lecture 9, Jesus as Bridegroom and the Church as Bride. Jesus fulfills in the flesh the role, to, role of bridegroom that the Old Testament foreshadowed when describing God as the bridegroom and Israel as his bride. As Petrie states, Jesus' actions are meant to signal that he is not only the Jewish Messiah, he is the divine bridegroom come in person to fulfill the prophecies of a new marriage covenant. John the Baptist, in Petrie's interpretation, is the first in Scripture to publicly identify Jesus as the Messianic bridegroom with, I am not the Messiah, I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. In this chapter, we will examine Jesus as bridegroom by focusing on the wedding at Cana, Jesus' meeting with the Samaritan woman at the well, the Eucharist, the Paschal mystery, and Jesus' second coming. This lecture will conclude with a reflection on Christian marriage. Wedding at Cana At the wedding of Cana, Jesus publicly revealed his identity as the divine bridegroom in person who was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Mary also assisted in introducing Jesus to the world as the bridegroom of the new Israel. Adeline Farabach explains in The Women in the Life of the Bridegroom, when the mother of Jesus says to Jesus, they have no wine, she places him in the role of the bridegroom, whose responsibility is to provide the wine. Jesus' action at the wedding at Cana of providing a superabundance of wine, Farah Bach argues, indicates that he was no ordinary bridegroom. He is no ordinary bridegroom because he is the messianic bridegroom of Israel, foretold by the Old Testament. The Cana marriage banquet that Jesus was at was a sign of a future marriage banquet in which Jesus would be the bridegroom. Jesus interprets Petrie indicates that this marriage banquet is in the future, with his words to Mary, My hour has not yet come. The hour of Jesus' marriage banquet began at the Last Supper. There, instead of turning water into wine, he gave his blood under the appearance of wine while saying, This is my blood of the covenant. Samaritan Woman Another way Jesus revealed he is the Messianic Bridegroom was by sitting with and talking to a Samaritan woman at a well. To understand the significance of these actions, it is necessary to know the Old Testament's background regarding wells. In the Old Testament, wells were common locations where men met their future wives, since women were tasked with drawing water. For example, demonstrates Petrie, Abraham's servant goes to a well to find a suitable, generous woman to be the wife for Isaac. By offering the servant and his camels water, Rebekah demonstrated to the servant that she was a suitable wife for Isaac. Isaac's sons Jacob similarly found a wife, Rachel, at a well. And Moses met his future wife Zipporah at a well. In all three examples, a foreigner, Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, obtain a wife who is first met at a well. In light of this biblical and also historical background, of wells being common places to meet a potential wife, Farah Bach comments that the disciples were surprised with Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman at a well, not because she was a woman, but because they did not express amazement before when Jesus related to women, but rather because of the combination of factors, including Jesus is a foreigner in Samaria, and he is talking with a woman at a well. Through the Samaritan woman, as a representative of the Samaritan's corporate sin of intermingling the Israelite religion with idol worship, Jesus offers himself to be their messianic bridegroom, and not only the messianic bridegroom of the Jewish people, since the Samaritans were ancestors of the Israelites who had intermarried with Gentiles settled by the Assyrian conquerors of 722 BC. Jesus, through the Samaritan woman, offered himself to them be the messianic bridegroom of all people. With Jesus indicates his Catholic universal messiahship by saying, 
If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The reference to living water has an important context that helps to interpret Jesus' words. Petrie explains that for ancient Jews, living water at times referred to water of a ritual bath a Jewish woman would take before she married. By promising to give living water, Jesus, therefore, is not only promising to give living water that the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of, where life-giving water flowed out of the side of the temple, but also explains Petrie, is this temple in person as the messianic bridegroom? The life-giving water that flows out of the temple prophesied by Ezekiel is fulfilled by the water and blood which flow from the pure side of Jesus as he hung on the cross. The water represents baptism, and the blood represents the Eucharist. Through baptism, Jesus cleanses his bride, not physically but spiritually, by washing away sin. In this way, baptism prepares a Christian to receive the Eucharist, the wedding banquet of the bridegroom. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, the entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the Church. Already baptism, the entry into the people of God, is a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist. Eucharist. Petrie describes the Last Supper as the wedding banquet of Jesus, anticipated at the wedding of Cana, because... If Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is his bride, the Lord's Supper is not just a memorial or a banquet of thanksgiving or a sacrifice. It is also a wedding banquet in which Jesus gives himself entirely to his bride in a new and everlasting marriage covenant. In other words, because Jesus fulfills the Old Testament and its types, in addition to being a memorial, a thanksgiving sacrificial meal, the Eucharist is also a wedding banquet. Those, therefore, who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb are to rejoice and exult. Recall that Moses at Mount Sinai sealed God's marital covenant with Israel by throwing blood on the Israelites and saying, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Similarly, as the fulfillment of Moses, the lawgiver, by being law in person, Jesus seals the new covenant with his own blood, by giving his blood to his disciples. Scott Hahn relates blood to the sealing of all marital covenants. When two become one in marriage, the bridegroom gives the bride his flesh and blood. The bride receives him his flesh and blood. The Greek word hyma, usually translated blood, can refer to other bodily fluids, including the man's seed. When he gives and she receives, they bring new life into the world. When does Christ, the bridegroom, unite himself with his bride? When does he give his flesh and blood in order to bring new life? In the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the sacrament of the consummation of the marriage between Christ and his church. In the Eucharist, he renews the new covenant, which is his marriage covenant with her. It is much more than a banquet. It is a wedding feast. We, the bride, receive our bridegroom's body in the Eucharist. The marital imagery of Christ's love for his church becomes a powerful symbol for the sacrament of marriage. Or, is marriage a powerful symbol of Christ's love for his church, for each of us? The sealing of the New Testament marital covenant followed by a heavenly marital banquet was, Petrie points out, prophesied by the prophets. And you can look at Jeremiah 31, 30-34 and Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. The Passion, Crucifixion, Resurrection, and Second Coming. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus proclaims himself a messianic bridegroom while indirectly referring to his future crucifixion when his marriage with his bride will be consummated with. The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. The ancient Jews had a custom to mourn 
when the bridegroom, after celebrating for one week with the people, left to be alone with his bride. Similarly, Jesus' death on the cross is the moment when he leaves to be alone with his bride. In addition to identifying Jesus' wedding day as the day of his death, the day of his crucifixion, Petrie also insightfully interprets details from Christ's passion and crucifixion as symbolic signs that Christ is consummating his marriage with his bride, the church. Christ's crown of thorns may be taken as signaling that he is a bridegroom, explains Petrie, because in ancient Jewish tradition, bridegrooms wore crowns. For example, the Song of Songs states, Look on King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. The seamless tunic that the Jewish Roman soldiers, that the Roman soldiers played lots for after crucifying Jesus, argues Petrie, represents both priestly garments, since Jesus is the one true high priest, and represents Jesus the bridegroom, since traditionally bridegrooms wore the garments of a priest. The seamless garment represents Jesus' priestly nature since, according to Exodus and Leviticus, a priestly garment is to be made so that it may not be torn. According to Petrie, as mentioned previously, the water that flowed from Jesus' side after being pierced with the spear is the fulfillment of the cleansing water a Jewish woman bathes herself in when taking a ritual bath before her wedding, and the water that flowed from the side of the temple in Ezekiel's vision. The water that flowed from Jesus' side, representing baptism, prepares for the wedding banquet of the Eucharist, represented by the blood that flowed from Jesus' pierced side. Finally, Petrie presents Jesus' paschal mystery as a recapitulation of Adam and Eve, where the new Adam is Christ and the new Eve is the Church. To support his recapitulation explanation, Petrie refers to St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where Paul commands husbands to love their wives as Christ loved his church by dying and giving himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her. Thus writes Petrie, the day of Jesus' crucifixion is his wedding day, when he, the new Adam, is joined to his wife and the church in an everlasting covenant. However, only when Jesus comes in his resurrected state at the end of time will he and his bride, the church, be definitively united. Petrie writes, Just as the Jewish Bible begins with the marriage of Adam and Eve, the New Testament ends with the marriage of God and humanity in the great wedding supper at the end of time. Christian Marriage In interpreting Paul's comparison of Christ's death on the cross to marriage, Petrie clarifies, Paul is not saying that the relationship between Christ and the church is like a human marriage. That would be getting him completely backwards. To the contrary, Paul is saying that the Christian marriage between a man and a woman should be like the supernatural love between Christ and the church. It is Christ's relationship with the church that is the great mystery, to which Christian marriage must look at its mo as its model. See Ephesians 5.32. When Christ's relationship with the church is understood as the ultimate marriage in its full truth upon which all others are to be patterned upon while always falling short, then the meaning of Catholic marriages become more evident. Unlike a purely civil marriage, which is essentially a contract, and unlike the Old Testament marriages which form a sacred family bond by a covenant, a Christian marriage explains Petrie is to be a living icon of the sacrificial spousal love between Christ and the Church. This means that not only is a Catholic couple to bond with one another and to be open to life with the hope for babies, but also they are to be mutually concerned with the other's sanctification because they are participating is a sacred sacrament. As a sacrament, marriage is a sacred sign of the invisible reality of God's eternal love, specifically Jesus' love for his bride, the church. Since Jesus demonstrated his love for his bride, the church sacrificially by laying down his life for her, in a Christian marriage that is to be a participation in Christ's love for his church, men are not to lead by, writes Petrie, by domination or intimidation. 
This is clear in how Paul instructs Christians to relate to one another within marriage and distinguishes a Christian understanding of marriage from the Greek and Roman understanding. Charles Reed explains, Christianity in its earliest forms adopted and adapted some aspects of the Greco-Roman synthesis on marriage and rejected other aspects altogether. It has been observed that many early Christian metaphors tended to be subverses of the language of authority that surrounded the Roman legal conception of the family. Where Roman law emphasized hierarchical power and submission, Christian metaphors focused on equality. In a frequently analyzed passage, after all, St. Paul boldly proclaimed that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor freeman, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This Christian transformation of Roman and Greek terminology and structures by emphasizing equality more by considering God as our Father does not mean, though, that St. Paul in Ephesians is teaching that the husband lacks leadership in their families in a way where wives and husbands are to be mutually subordinate to one another without distinction. Paul clearly states that the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of his body, the church. In this verse, the leadership of the husband is described with the metaphor of head, traditionally representing objectivity, logic, and law, while implying, implying the wife's leadership with the heart, traditionally representing subjectivity, the personal, prudence, and wisdom. As Petrie comments, A headless person is a dead person, and a heartless person is a dead person. The question is the head or heart more important is meaningless, since they both need each other in an essential way. The man is naturally ordered to governing, and the woman is naturally ordered to loving. The end is peace and harmony at home. Virgin and celibates, in other words, religious sisters and celibate priests, are sacred signs of the invisible reality of Jesus' spousal and sacrificial love, but in a different complementary manner. Married couples are signs pointing to what is to come. Virgins and celibates are signs of a reality that has already come, but in a not yet perfected state. In heaven, we all will be married to God. And for this reason, physical marriages between individuals will cease since they will lose their meaning. In the next lecture, Lecture 10, we will focus our attention on the early church and the magisterium's teaching on marriage. God bless.